Hey listeners, it's Paul Andriola here. Why not join our community at Small Cap Discoveries where we offer our members direct access to some of the best microcap investment opportunities available. Our members are getting access to premium microcap financing, research reports, and direct access to management. Sign up today at www.smallcapdiscoveries.com. Hi everyone, welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries conference call. Today on our call, we have CEO Atul Sabarwal from SNP Interactive. SNP trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol SPN and on the OTC under SNIPF. The company is trading at 17 cents with roughly 235 million shares outstanding or about a $40 million market cap. I now hand it over to Paul Andriola. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Um, great to have a tool back. Um, a tool we had you on a couple months ago. Um, uh, what we've noticed is you guys are landing a lot of contracts, putting out a fair bit of news. So we thought it'd be a good time to have you uh, back um, and uh, sort of update us on, on the business. Um, but uh, before we start, why don't you uh, tell us more about what, uh, what SNP is all about? Yep. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Trevor. <clears throat> um, thanks for having me back. And Thank you all for taking the time. Just the usual disclaimer stuff, um, financial projections and all of that good stuff. Um, just, you know, we, we built a platform that we call SNP Care, which stands for customer acquisition, retention and engagement. Um, and it's basically a data analytics, um, you know, machine learning based platform that allows us to collect all sorts of great data about customers to enable them, you know, to be easily acquired, retained by the brand and engaged with in order to generate first party data sets, which is becoming increasingly important in this world as you know, cookie based targeting goes away, right? Um, you know, we have a really large diversified base of um, Fortune 500 companies. No one client of ours is more than, you know, 5% of our revenue. Um, we are, a, we are, a, Certified vendor for Procter & Gamble, Kellogg's, Starbucks, Nestle, um, L'Oreal, and a bunch of household brands, Starbucks, et cetera, right? Um, you know, our machine learning engine to validate a user's image, um, you know, which I'll show you in about two minutes just to give you a sense of it, right? Um, is the industry leader with all large, you know, programs in the North American market working on our platform. Um, that engine is actually a hook into multiple industries, into multiple program types, um, and has really opened up the door for us to be able to expand, you know, into various types of geographies, industries, um, uh, and, you know, different kinds of solutions built on it, right? Um, we do have multiple revenue streams, um, a good mix of long-term recurring SaaS type revenues, and, you know, more project-based revenues. Um, that mixes, you know, about 50%, um, split 50% on our revenue streams. We have no debt, um, you know, and we are growing profitably, profitably, um, not only at the EBITDA level, but also at the net income level. So, um, that's some of the key, you know, things about, about the company. Um, we're going to have a pretty good year. I've already told the world this, um, you know, we hit the half year mark at 5.6 million, you know, we should be able to, 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 you know, meet or exceed where we are right now um, by the end of by the end of this year, right? So it's gonna be great top line growth, even better bottom line growth. Um, and we're reinvesting all of that cash into new markets, new solutions built around our core engine um, to scale this company. Um, so let me let me let me let me go to this last one slide to give you a sense of the growth opportunity sitting in front of us. Today, SNP, you know, sits right here at the bottom of, you know, five simple questions that any business owner, any brand, doesn't matter what the industry is, has to answer, right? The five questions are, who is my customer? Where can I find them? How do I target them? Do they actually buy what I'm selling? And how do I keep them coming back? Pretty simple, logical questions, right? We specialized in building a technology solution around, hey, can we verify someone bought something, right? And if we can do that, how do we keep them coming back? So we do anywhere between, you know, 400, you know, this number is now up, 400 programs a year for our clients, right? 
And for each of these programs, you know, clients are also spending a bunch of money on media targeting, right? Which we don't do today. But this is one example of the growth potential sitting in front of us for the simple reason that, you know, for every program that I actually implement for a client, right? We can also start capturing their media budget to give them a full view of the purchase data um, that sits at the bottom of the path to purchase, but also the media data that sits on top of it. Um, you know, and you know, the amount of money that they spend for each of these programs on the media side can run anywhere from a hundred to five million dollars. So if you take my 400 programs a year that I do, you know, and if half of them, you know, I can start selling media against, you know, that adds to the level. Um, and the adds to the revenue potential and another stream of revenue for us quite easily. So we've got ideas around that that you know um, that that we are working on right now, um, which will be quite 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 interesting for the company and for for all you investors out there. Um, let me let me stop there for a second, right? Um, yeah, Paul, do you want to now open it up or like you know that that's basically the overview of the yeah. company. Yeah, um, and I would remind everybody that's listening, if you've got questions uh, you want me to ask a tool, please uh, use the chat function uh, that's available uh, down below, and I'll do my best to ask questions. Um, a, a tool, first off, like, you know, a significant increase in revenue that we've seen here. What, what's really driving that pickup in revenue here uh, over the last sort of six to 12 months? Yeah, so, you know, it really is just our clients, and, you know, they need to capture better data. So let me go back to sharing my screen for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to share my entire desktop. Let's let's do that. Right. So so you know our our clients right um, are a range of different types of companies ranging from you know every home you know everybody buys something from Nestle or from a PNG. Everybody knows Red Bull, but also clients like Duramax who are you know oil companies right. And what's driving our growth really is the fact that the world has realized that they need to start understanding purchase habits. So if you think about advertising and about marketing, right, historically, you know, um, a client would spend a lot of money in television, print and radio, and they would have no clue whether that actually resulted in people buying their product, right? Um, when the internet came along, you know, clients were really happy and, you know, that, a Google or a Facebook could actually tell them that someone engaged with the advertising, but they still couldn't actually figure out if someone bought, you know, their product. As a result, um, you know, clients had to figure out what is my physical media spend, what is my digital media spend, but none of those spends actually resulted in, in a client being able to assess whether someone bought something, which is really what drives their PNL, right? Um, the one component of that would be loyalty programs as an example, but loyalty programs before we came around were limited to um, a, a, a retailer or an airline or a hotel, right? Mm -hmm. So all of these brands that I'm showing you here, they all suffer from the same, same you know, problems, which is like, if I'm selling my products to a third party, how do I measure, you know, the success of that? Um, and they're now beginning to realize that you know, they need to find a way to actually capture data all the way at the bottom of the funnel, which is really, did you buy something, right? Um, and that's what's driving our growth as more and more industries realize the value of that data and being able to connect the media part of the world to, you know, mm. the um, the actual purchase. Maybe explain to us, like, how does, um, you know, Nestle will sell a bunch of products through a retail channel. Uh, the retail channel, you know, whatever call it a grocery store, is going to want to control that customer. But I think what I'm understanding is that this allows Nestle to be able to really get data that they wouldn't otherwise get um, with that right. customer, right? That walks into, you know, the corner grocery store, or the big uh, grocery chain. Tell us, walk us through how, how does Nestle get that data from you guys? Right. So, so think of, think of the, the world of manufacturers and retailers and you and me, the consumer, right? doesn't matter what industry we are in, right? A manufacturer doesn't care where you buy their product. If you were building and selling something, you wouldn't really care where people buy it, whether from mm -hmm. you or from a third party, as long as they buy your product, right? Um, similarly, if you were a shopkeeper or a shop owner, right? Or a retailer, right? You wouldn't care what people 
buy from you as long as they come to you to buy that product. Mm -hmm. So if you take the dynamics in this example as a Nestle and a Walmart, right? Nestle doesn't really, you know, know that Walmart's selling Nestle products except for what their inventory position is. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the paradigm in the industry has always been that, you know, I as a manufacturer um, only care about my products, whereas the retailer, their paradigm has always been, I don't care about what the products are as long as you come to my store, but the manufacturer has to care about what the retailer thinks because the retailer is the one that actually controls the relationship between Paul and Walmart, right? Now that data, so who's the customer, right? If Paul is consuming Pellegrino um, from Nestle, right? He's not a customer of Pellegrino. He's a customer of the retail store he shopped at, right? Yeah. Now, why would anybody in their right mind give a vendor sitting on a shelf in any industry, right? Your customer list, right? So that data is controlled very carefully by the retailer. And as a result, you know, even though a company like, um, even though a company like, um, you know, Nestle is a consumer products group, they actually have very little consumer information because that information is all stuck at the retailer. Mm -hmm. So how we, how we, um, how we work to ask, to answer, we, we work in a variety of different ways to get that, that data. Here's an example of a program, right? Where um, I, you can win one of 10 virtual cooking experiences as an example, right? Now, Nestle is out there advertising this program because they're trying to drive some marketing objective of theirs, which could be, you know, they're trying to drive market share, they could be responding to a competitive threat, you know, they could be trying to build their CRM to understand Paul and people like Paul, right? Um, in the early days, they would just be able to spray and pray the advertising, as an mm -hmm. example. They would have no way to know if actually Paul went in and bought something. But well, we developed a platform in the early days of our you know, existence and we're the leading you know, market uh, machine learning engine for this, where a user can simply go into any, any store in the country, take a photograph of their purchase receipt, and as a result of doing that and sending it to us, we can actually see what they bought, right? And this AI engine and this machine learning engine that we've built, which I'm gonna show you in a second, allows us to understand what Paul bought, where he bought it, how much he spent on it, what else he bought, which is all data sitting at the retailer that the retailer never shares with anybody because that's their customer information, mm. right? So now Nestle can simply go to Facebook or go to Twitter, you know, go to television if they wanted to, but link all those advertising channels and see what happened at a Walmart versus a Target. So as an example, let, let me show you our backend AI engine, right? Here, here, here is a engine where it is 442 on the East Coast, as an example, right? Mm -hmm. And you're seeing for various clients of ours, people are obviously drinking coffee right now, just like I am, <laughs> you know, they're sending in a image of their purchase receipt. So here's someone who went in at 441, right? And they went to Costco and they bought a lot of stuff, right? Starbucks has a very successful program with 20 million people. And this is all real time. So I'm just picking this as an example. I could pick, you know, anything else here, right? Starbucks has about 20 million people in their loyalty program where Starbucks knows everything about Paul when Paul walks into a Starbucks store, but they know nothing about Paul when Paul goes grocery shopping, right? So what happens? Paul is part of the loyalty program. He wants to get more points. He's not in a Starbucks store. He's gone to Costco. Um, you know, he takes a photograph of his purchase receipt, sends it to us. We have a pretty Uber platform to make it very easy. And what our system does is we go out there and we look for the qualifying products for that program and we find them through our AI engine. And every day that we, we see about 50,000 of these receipts coming in in real time, right? And that's what I'm showing you, right? So, um, so what you're seeing here is, you know, a receipt that's coming from a Costco. We found one of, you know, thousands of products of, of, of Starbucks that is sold at the store and understood that that is a Starbucks French Rose 2.5 pound bag of whole beans. And that person now, Paul, has now got his green stars in the, in the app, right? Mm -hmm. However, we go one step ahead and we then look at everything else that's on this receipt and we map it to a universal taxonomy that Starbucks can now understand what does Paul buy when he goes shopping? Mm -hmm. And they can aggregate that up and they can do a variety of different things with this data, which is, okay, should I place my Starbucks coffee next to the banana aisle because X percent of my users always buy bananas when they go shopping? Or can I do a better targeted digital ad because now I can find people with similar patterns and profiles of Paul's behavior, 
right? So, you know, I can show you some of our, some of our real-time data sets that our clients are aggregating. I'll just open up one as an example. Let's use, let's use a Pampers campaign, right? Um, I'm just gonna use a, you know, a example of, of one of our clients, which is a very large company. And, you know, we can, we can see, right, um, quite easily, right, mm -hmm. the number of people who've participated, right? We can see how they did different types of incentives over time. We can see the types of products, you know, so in this case, Pampers can now see the types of products that people have bought across the country. You know, they can actually see what those products are by store and they can see the difference between what's being bought at a target versus a target.com, right? Um, you know, they can, see, they can see these differences just by clicking through and, you know, they can see what the performance was of their program tied to purchase, you know, um, as these receipts come in. So this is an example of a, of a program where on day one, that was the baseline, you know, they basically did an email blast to Walmart and Target users. They see the lift between, you know, what happened at Walmart versus what happened in Target, right? They, went, they then went, you know, silent for a little while, then they went national and, you know, they got TV advertising, then they got in-store displays, you know, so there's a whole, there's a whole variety of data that you can see from the humble receipt that comes in, uh, which includes being able to do loyalty programs. You know, here's my, here's my favorite one, right? Where you can, you can literally in real time go out and see what is in Paul's basket. And as an example, right, I can click on this and say, oh, Paul, Paul went out to buy diapers. Oh, he also buys beverages. Very interesting. What kind of beverages? Oh, Paul's an alcoholic alcoholic <laughs> beverage bio that is mine coffee. that is mine then yeah <laughs> right oh he's buying mixes let's see what kind of mixes he's having right he's buying tonic water what brand of tonic water you know is he buying oh he's buying the walmart house brand right but right. this kind of analysis they don't no one has this kind of data mm -hmm. is just wow. completely proprietary um you know and this is all coming to us in real time from people submitting receipts um <laughs> as you know across our programs we see over fifty thousand of these every day and we can leverage this in multiple different ways, right? So again, it's mm -hmm. gone up to 1247, you know, it's 447 now on the East Coast. Um, you know, you can see, you know, people submitting receipts for, here's one from Canada, you know, someone at the West Edmonton Mall, you know, submitted a receipt, we verify that this location is at the mall, you know, and given them their points, right? Um, or whatever the program is on the back end, right? So, so there's a variety of different, you know, use cases of our platform even though it's the same platform. So when, as my sales starts scaling, my costs don't have to, which is why we're one of the few rare companies that actually generate cash um, now because our engines have been built and you know we can um, utilize these engines in various ways um, to do literally any kind of program for our clients, right? Sorry, long answer to your question, but I think, um, yeah, I just wanted no, to demonstrate that that's, too. That's great. No, I, th I think that that's fantastic insight. I, um... Uh, much better understanding of, uh, of the process and what you guys, you know, the data you deliver. I was very impressed with uh, um, the, the, the data that, that uh, a, a, you know, a, a company has access to through this. It's, uh, it's quite, a, quite startling, actually. Um, yeah, and if you, go, if you go and check out our website to the cases, we always, where we have the rights to, we'll put it, we can't, you know, talk mm -hmm. about client brands because some of this is very strategic and tactical sure. but we do list you know some of these programs on our website and you can actually go check out the variety of different programs just on this page mm -hmm. you know this is a dairy cooperative you know this is a cpg this is dr pepper this mm -hmm. is you know um an oil company you know you've got this is an alcohol sector this is a pharma company they all same platform different use cases right there's mm -hmm. a cat food company that, you know, that has one of the big loyalty programs um, and you can go check them out. Right. And the data mm -hmm. coming out of it is just so rich. So, um, like I said earlier, I mean, we're, we're seeing you announce a fair number of, uh, well, some renewal contracts, but also new contracts. What, um, like, what, if anything has changed over the last little while and, and, and um, how do you go and, sort of continue to, to grow this way or, you know, accelerate it if you can. What, what is it that's happening to bring these clients on board right now? 
So, you know, the funny thing is nothing has changed except that we decided to start talking about our platform a little bit mm. more because we hit profitability, right? Yeah. Um, so it's the same. So that's one, one aspect of it. The second mm. aspect of it is as clients complete pilots, you know, it, it takes a long mm. time for a CPG to adopt a technology, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so the, the thing that what's happening here is that I was making a loss before, right? And I didn't want to raise money and dilute our shareholders. Mm. So, we're playing the long game here, right? We're like, okay, we know we're going to hit profitability. When that profitability hits, then I can start reinvesting that into sales, mm -hmm. right? I started doing that. What are the easiest sales for us to invest in? Take our same clients and go overseas with them because they have the same problem globally, right? right. I'm already a PNG vendor. I'm already a Nestle vendor. I'm already an XYZ vendor, right? Mm -hmm. It's a hop, skip, and jump for us to, you know, move across borders. So, so you know, we've mm -hmm. recruited three people in Europe now, right? Um, we've done trials and completed trials with Asian divisions of these companies. Um, that's one. So that's the second piece, right? A, we started talking. B, we started, you know, going overseas with these same companies because I could now invest in the infrastructure needed to support them in different markets. And C, because of the investment, we now have the ability to go out and our own investment from our own cash flows to go out and start talking to different industries, right? And mm -hmm. you're seeing the variety of industries that we've, you know, we're getting business from, right? Um, so, so those are the, really the three main drivers of why you're mm -hmm. seeing this and why it'll continue. Because you know, now now we've got we've got a seed in, we've got capital to invest without actually having to raise and dilute people. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. do I want to make that faster? Yeah, sure. Do I want to get to you know twenty five million next year? Do I want to get to forty million next year? Right? Mm -hmm. We know what the model is, right? Yeah. Question is how much capital can I put into it, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's, that's the key here, right? Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Um, you're reinvesting, uh, you're, you're basically doubling down on, on what's working, uh, getting more salespeople on the ground. Um, yeah, uh, it clearly. And we're doing it for our own cash flows, Paul, which is the big right. difference, right? Yeah. Like, come, come, people ask me like, why don't you do this faster? And I'm like, we could, but then there's a trade-off in yeah. terms of equity value dilution versus sure. growth, right? And there yeah. is a lead time to it. Yeah. So we're just managing that equation very carefully so that our investors, are, you know, yeah. are happy campers. Yeah, fully understand. Now you mentioned trials. Um, so I imagine that you're going to potentially big client, you're, you know, they're going to want to see some proof that this works for them. Um, how long does that typically take? Can you give me a sense of what a trial looks like if you're going to a new client? A trial can take anywhere from three months to a year. It mm -hmm. just depends on, you know, let me, let me explain that um, mm -hmm. in the sense of, this this document right am i still sharing my screen i am yeah, right? yeah, we can yeah. See it, yeah. so so there are a variety of reasons sorry clients mm -hmm. do programs right there is a tactical reason and there's a strategic reason right the trials take place typically <clears throat> at the tactical level because a client has a problem what could that problem be think of the world of diet coke and diet pepsi i'm sitting in front of walmart and Walmart says, hey, you know what? Halloween is coming up, mm -hmm. right? What program are you going to run, you know, for me, right? That'll help me as Walmart, you know, drive my business. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, the customer of a Coke and a Pepsi is not Paul. It is Walmart, right? If Walmart tells them to jump and they don't jump, they can be thrown out of the store or reduced exposure. And I, when I say store, I mean offline and online store, right? Mm -hmm. So both Pepsi and and again, not Pepsi and Coke, but Diet Pepsi as one brand and Diet Coke as one brand mm. are sitting there competing for that particular exposure with their customer. The customer is asking them to help their business. Pretty reasonable request. If Pepsi says, I can't do much, you know, and Coke says, I can do something like a program, you know, to drive, mm. buy a six pack to get a $5 Walmart gift card. Mm. The $5 Walmart gift card is revenue for the revenue for Walmart, right? It also gives exposure to the, to the, to the world of, of, you know, Cola drinkers saying, hey, there's an offer going on. Go to Walmart and it's exclusive to Walmart. Go buy it at Walmart. It's going to mm -hmm. drive more people into Walmart. Like I said before, the retailer doesn't care what you buy as long as you buy from them, right? Mm -hmm. So when you go to Walmart, you don't go to buy just a Coke. You go to buy a whole bunch of stuff. So if Walmart can get Coke or someone to like give an offer that drives a person into their store online or offline. It's going to result in a multiple of revenue for them from selling products, right? Same concept with the Home Depot, same concept with the Nordstrom, mm -hmm. same concept with, you know, Lumber yards, it, it doesn't matter what the industry is, mm -hmm. right? So 
being able to you know put that offer in right mm-hmm. is a very competitive business right in order to keep the customer of the manufacturer happy so that is why you know some of these programs you know at the tactical level um drive the pilots right mm-hmm. so if i can prove to a coke or a pepsi that at the diet at the brand level that you know we're going to make your customer happy as one example of a tactical requirement right mm-hmm. they're going to come and work with us further but that's not the only requirement what if a what if a competitor launches a new product right how do you react to that drop your price or make an offer in the olden days they would have to go pull physical products off the shelf create a whole media strategy etc etc right but now you can just go to facebook and say hey buy x get y mm-hmm. right and suddenly you've countered that effect right so that so, so on this page i mean i could spend two hours talking to you about the different tactical reasons as to why clients do this right mm-hmm. once clients do the tactical reasons right so you know they then see the value of the data that i was showing you and now the strategic mm-hmm. reasons start coming up which is mm-hmm. hey can we use it for market research hey can we use it for better ad targeting right and that's where my multiplier effect starts will start mm-hmm. kicking in let me just put this way i'm not even there yet i haven't yet sold media At some point mm-hmm. in the future we launch snip media right which is hey you're doing 400 500 programs with us give us part of your media budget right hey you have market research running on the background right we can help you with that market research same platform mm-hmm. different application right mm-hmm. so so that's the pilot you know the pilot lens differ right mm-hmm. depending on the tactical or strategic nature of who we are talking to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. gotcha um why don't we jump into some of the questions that we got from some of the the listeners here um Now you I saw uh, GSK so a pharmaceutical company that uh, is one of your clients D- tell me how how would it work uh with a pharmaceutical client, a client uh, what kind of promotions do pharmaceutical clients run um again same problem right same mm-hmm. same um, same types of programs i was just showing you right mm-hmm. um let's look at what they're doing <clears throat> they're trying to drive trial of a new new drug which is over the counter mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. here's one from GSK right you know flu season comes around you know spring uh, allergy season comes around it's the same thing it doesn't matter whether you're selling mm-hmm. a occ sure. drug you're selling cereal you're selling an oil change same fundamental competitive problems especially when you're selling through a third party gotcha gotcha no fair enough um uh very good point um So we've got another question uh refers to your backlog. So company announced 9.5 million US dollars in backlog at the end of Q2. That's 157% increase year over year. Should investors think similar type of growth for long term? Yeah, so you know, we as we invest in our sales and marketing, I still only have one person who does marketing in this entire company. Um we live and breathe by our backlog. Mm-hmm. So yes. Mm-hmm. And, and and okay so let's touch that on a little bit more so you know th- this past year has been a, a very solid revenue growth uh business or or um you know good year of, of revenue growth um you're now increasing your your spend on sales people and sort of again doubling down on what worked well last year what what kind of longer term growth can we see in this business and what's the addressable market for for something like this So the addressable market is let me let me start with the second one first right mm-hmm. i mean it is a humongous market now it depends on how you define where i play i play here today but i'm going to start playing i already start you know some of the contracts have announced actually here where we are helping companies like ipsos which is one of the largest research companies in the world do stuff right those those press releases about being in 39 countries or 36 countries or you know i announced one in seven new countries with a beverage manufacturer which was coke right it all came through our research industry um you know footprint right that we are building slowly but steadily you know utility is another big place right but you know that this is how big the market is right i'm just a tiny tiny fraction of it but i'm the only one who has an engine that's that accurate on the image and the transaction processing the receipt processing side right mm-hmm. so you know for me you know even backlog right i mean i would i would encourage you guys not to think about backlog for more i don't i don't necessarily manage the business quarter to quarter um i manage it you know on a year on year basis because we're too small to manage it as a quarter to quarter basis right 
Um, mm -hmm. There are long lead times in the pilots, but once you have a pilot done and a client likes what they're seeing, the multiplier effect becomes massive. Mm -hmm. If I work with San Pellegrino and Nestle and they like me, I can then go to Nescafe. I can go to Gerber, which I already work with. I can mm -hmm. go to one of their 300 brands, you know, because now I'm an approved vendor and they've seen pilots work, but each one will ask us to do a pilot. So we're playing a very long game here, guys, right? Mm -hmm. But you're going to see the you're going to see the revenue inflection happen. And then the question becomes, you know, should I go after market share, mm -hmm. right? In which case I need to start spending money to do it. But then I need to think about where's that money coming from because I'm not raising money, right? Mm -hmm. um, or do I stay and do what we've done over the last three years, which is grow profitably, mm -hmm. you know, as we've made the investments. We first made the investment in the tech platforms after we raised money, a long time back. Now mm -hmm. we have to do the the sales investment, right? Um, so, so yeah. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but like you know, we 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 are we are at that point where we need to make a decision of how we want to grow as a company. Mm -hmm. Is it better to go for a fifty million revenue stream, even if you're losing five or six million a year, mm -hmm. and then uplist maybe to the Nasdaq or something, or is it mm -hmm. better to just going, you know? Where well, we are, properly, eight point yeah. six, you know, yeah, and that yeah. that is a. Why don't you guys tell me? You all are the investors in this company. <laughs> Which one would you prefer? You know, because that you know, for me, honestly, I would rather go big. Yeah. You know, spend the money to make it happen. Now that you can prove that the model's working, right? Yeah. You know, I know that every time I hire a salesperson, it takes about nine months to get them to monetize, and for every three mm -hmm. people I hire, probably two will fail. Mm -hmm. We right. have, you know, I can get into more detail on this at some point, but mm -hmm. I don't want to reveal our model to people, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, it's a question: Okay, how much do I, how, how much do I push into that funnel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, the sense I get, and we're seeing it reflected in the financials. That you guys are at, at some some degree of an inflection point here, and, and and so it's trying to break down exactly what it is causing that inflection point. And the sense I get is partly. You got more cash to work with, and you're now, you know, spending money on on what clearly has worked. And you're right. If if uh, if you see something that's working and there's a, an obvious return on investment that makes sense, then yeah, it, it seems like the the right answer is you spend more money to go and get that long term value of the client. So um, I I you know I, I sort of understand your dilemma, um, but I uh, imagine you're in a easier spot now than you were a year ago. So yeah, so put uh, it this way, if the stock price reached a valuation that we think reflects true value for our company, mm -hmm. I wouldn't hesitate raising money because then I can turbocharge the growth organically. Yeah. Right. If so the stock, was, if, you know, a, a yeah. lot depends on the stock price for me and the yeah. way we make decisions. If the stock yeah. is too low, fine. We can run a marathon. You've seen yeah. us do it for the last, you know, two, three years, right? Mm -hmm. People have written us off. Come on, I bought shares for like two cents, a lot of yeah. them, yeah. right? Because, okay, the whole market's writing you off. Good for you. We'll come back. And, yeah. you know, now it's started to come back. But now how far can it go up? But I still think we're significantly undervalued. Just take any comp in the market right now, mm -hmm. right? So if the, if the comp start becoming more in line with what our valuation should be, great. We can then take that and leverage it, right? Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't, mm -hmm. then there's no point diluting everybody. Yeah. I love making money and I'm, you know, yeah. founder of this company. So I need to make money at some point, but I want to make big money. I don't want to make small money. Sure. Yeah. So, so I mean, obviously the question, where, where, where do you think uh, fair value is for the business right now? What, what should the stock be trading in your opinion? I, I, I think, I think a 50 to 60 cent range today is fair based on what you all know. Okay. And okay. based on where the comms are. Yeah. Right. You know, Good. Good. that, that is what I look at you know, and track. And, you know, we, again, we will, we are very flexible as a company. So we will, you know, block and tackle as mm -hmm. value is, you know, created. Like one thing to note, like our entire, our entire um, stock appreciation over the last, you know, 12 months is not driven mm -hmm. by any IR. I don't even have an mm -hmm. IR firm on, on, on staff, right? It's based on pure fundamentals, which is really what we thought should happen. That if you build it and you can prove the financial mm -hmm. metrics, mm -hmm. they come. But that's not how technology companies actually, you know, work. Most right. technology companies work on the opposite principle, you know, which is don't make a profit. Are you stupid? Yeah. You know, exactly. and, and, and <laughs> you know, we are doing, you know, so, so, so now if I can just, yeah. for me, if I can get investors to believe that this model works, we've got mm -hmm. the best clientele on the planet. I can tell you this much, right? Mm -hmm. Trust that. Okay. 
hey, this guy is not selling snake oil or, you know, he's not an idiot, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, we had one, two, three cent for the longest time, biggest opportunity on the planet for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. But there was a credibility issue with me probably, right? Okay, so how long do you need me to show you that this model works? Because mm-hmm. then we can actually take it to a more traditional tech company kind of growth rate, right? Mm-hmm. You know, but that yeah. requires the investment, right? Yeah. Yeah. And if not, that's fine. We can mm-hmm. still keep growing like this. It's not a bad, we're not having a bad year, as you can see. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we, EBITDA is growing in triple digits, I think. And like, um, you know, revenue is growing in double digits, which is mm-hmm. always a good thing. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let's, let's carry on with a couple more questions here. Um, okay, so somebody here has asked, does the company have any plans to report revenues by line of business in the MDNA in the future? Well, honestly, we only have one line of business, which mm-hmm. is our care platform. Mm-hmm. Its applicability has been different industries and different kinds of products like a SNP loyalty or a SNP reward or like a SNP, you know. Yeah, I think, you know, look, guys, we're a sub $20 million company right now, mm-hmm. right? Um, we, we, we have no short-term plans to break out revenue by products, partly because, you know, we have competition vertically, but we don't have competition horizontally, mm-hmm. right? I don't need the loyalty vendors I'm competing with there who are not only friends of mine, they're not friends, they're frenemies and enemies mm-hmm. of mine mm-hmm. know what I'm generating in that world. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. it's in, not in our competitive interest to do that yet. Mm-hmm. You know, or take Snipchat, my receipt processing engine. Why do I want to give clients an indication of, you know, what pricing is, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, no. so, so it's much easier. And at the end of the day, it's one platform. You take mm-hmm. any component of it, you know, we are pretty agnostic to that, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, so we're just trying to make sure that people can't, um, you know, peel back the onion to then Imagine. figure out because, you know, we have, we, we have to deal with PNG's procurement team or Nestle's right. procurement team, the smartest people on the planet, mm-hmm. right? You give mm-hmm. them a little bit of data to go by, they will negotiate it and figure it out. So right. I like the bundled, you need SNP care, which component do you want? Great, right? right? But I don't need them to know how we're selling SNP care to you know, you need mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Now, this is more of a statement, but I, I, I can get a question out of it. Um, you know, the for your program to work, you've got a, you know, a, a consumer has to provide a receipt. Um, does that limit the demographic you're, you're drawing from? Like, you know, I, I would think that those that are more affluent are less likely to to be giving up this data because they're less likely to be worried about promotion programs. What, what can you say to that? Everybody has a price. Right. right? <laughs> and, Good answer. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's number one. Number yeah. two, our platform is not limited to receipt based programs, okay. right? Mm-hmm. So um, here's, here's YSL. Everybody agree it's a high end brand. Can you see my screen? Or no? Yeah. See it? Yep. Right. This is, this is YSL, right? Yves Saint Laurent, right? Mm-hmm. You can't get higher than this in the world of beauty in some ways, right? They mm-hmm. sit on top. Here's their program that we run for them, which is all based on, you know, um, earn while you spend, submit a picture you receive, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, there are, there are, everybody has their, you know, the way the world works is that Think about it. Everybody has an Air Canada frequent flyer card. You gave mm-hmm. a ton of data to do that. You did something to get that card. You filled up a form. You did something. Sure. Yep. It worked for you guys, right? Yeah. So um, have I participated in a program where I send in a receipt to get a buck off my next Kellogg's? No. I'm not the demographic for it. Mm-hmm. Have I participated in it for Starbucks because I drink a lot of coffee? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Right? So it just, it, it works across the spectrum, right? And again, our tactics are not tied to only receipt, right? So we have a, you know, a platform that's actually very modular and you can activate users, you can validate the action. Our core engine could be, you know, nothing to do with receipt submission as part of the program. Share mm-hmm. with a friend to get something or take the world of research, right? Fill up a survey to get something, mm-hmm. right? Um, you can add a receipt to it if you want. Right, it's mm-hmm. not always purchase based. So we we look at our, our companies. You know, this is our core engine because we built this to begin with, and this is our hook to get in. Mm-hmm. But we've expanded our capability to be able to validate any kind of user action because each action is a data element, mm-hmm. and those actions are basically summarized as twofold. 
Did you buy something or did you not buy something non-purchase behavior that is valuable to me, right? What would be those things? Did you share with a friend? I would love for one rich person to share with another rich person something. <laughs> right? Any customer sharing another customer, right? Did you fill yeah. up a survey? That's the whole research industry, right? Yeah. Did you like tweet pin, right? You know, yeah. um, so, so there's a whole world of our programs where we, we're about to launch a program. Well, we should be able to launch it soon um, in, I think, five different countries where all you have to do is fill up a survey to get somewhere, mm-hmm. right? Nothing to do with purchase. It's just to drive engagement. That's it. Yeah. And buzz. So, you know, our platforms, and that's the beauty of the risk, you know, mitigation, you know, fundamental theory of finance, right? Diversification mm-hmm. reduces mm-hmm. risk, mm-hmm. right? My sure. revenue streams are diversified. It could be purchase based. It could be non-purchase based. It could be loyalty points based. It could be pure cashback programs based. It could be market research. It could be CPG. It could be utility. It could be mm-hmm. America. It could be the UK. It could be India. Right. So, you know, that's the way we are thinking through our model of growth. Right. Makes sense. Absolutely. Um, the, um, now you mentioned you're going to start getting more into, you know, grabbing, um, sort of wallet share of media spend. Um, what other sort of new products or initiatives, and you don't have to be specific, but I'm just trying to get a general sense of trend. Um, where are you guys innovating or where are you guys, you know, where, where are those new sort of innovations uh, you guys are driving towards okay so so the first the first piece of this is just being able to um make sure that we can process things in any country across our platform Mm -hmm. it requires a lot of innovation so i think someone's asking us right now about our partnership with shishido right Mm -hmm. yeah it's a great partnership we've only launched one country of this canada right there, you know, and again, I don't want to get into details of customers, but there are other customers in like the baby food industry, you know, cleaning supplies, cereal, right? We've done pilots in six or seven different countries and they really wanted to roll out pretty much globally, right? So being able to support a image coming in from Japan, mm. you know, um, and being able to understand that data set and build the machine learning algorithms around it, a lot of innovation. So we're doing a lot of that, right? Mm. Number two, you know, uh, rewards engine, right, where you can literally transfer money to any part of the world as an incentive back, right, requires us to have relationships with various fintech companies. We already have a very deep relationship with PayPal and another one called Revolut, right, mm-hmm. which allows me to do, hey, spend X in Japan to get a five, 500 yen, blah, 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 right? Mm-hmm. So adding more partners into our reward ecosystem, it's already one of the most unique reward ecosystems out there because we've got so many integrations in it, right? Mm -hmm. It allows me to deploy globally. It's another huge, huge competitive advantage of ours, right? Mm -hmm. That's another innovation. And then comes the data layer, right? Putting in an AI engine that actually allows you to utilize this data. The one thing to understand is that, you know, AI is a great buzzword, as is Mm -hmm. machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. But in order for you to be able to use AI, you actually need data. Yeah. Yeah. Where are we today in our evolution? We're just creating the data set, right? Mm. That is the innovation today. But now I have a ton of data, right? Mm. So what's the next natural extension of that? Let's put an AI engine. I already have an AI engine to normalize the data that I am collecting, right? But now can I take that data and make it smarter? Can I have built a data set that's significant enough? You know? Gotcha. Yeah. And that's, that's another area that we are focusing on a lot. Um, but, you know, for, you know, to, yeah, so those, those would be like three key areas for us, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to continue just, you know, because the opportunity is, you know, forget all the sophisticated buzzword stuff. It's like, mm-hmm. hey, clients need to generate that data to begin with. Let's yeah. help them do that. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then you can leverage the data in multiple different ways. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, that's a big driver of a lot of businesses right now is just getting access to the data and then parsing it, right? Um, one, one quick question, then we'll wrap up with a, a couple other questions that I have, but, uh, the question is Coke and Pepsi, are they both clients of yours? <laughs> are you allowed to say? <laughs> and what, and, and what do you prefer? You Coke find or Pepsi? a way to work with both of them. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. I would say uh, same with a Kellogg's General Mills, same with, uh, yeah. you know, Pfizer, GSK. Although I think one bought the other the other day, but like, you know, so mm-hmm. we have, 
we are a technology company, guys. You know, so the way I talk to clients when it comes to conflicts is we're not an agency. We never will be, right? You're a tool. You're a tool. Used by all yeah. you guys and you have no mm -hmm. issue using us because yeah. we're not sharing data. We're not, you know, um, we're just a tech tool for you. Yeah, exactly. No, that's the way I see it as well. Um, okay, one more question here. Is uh, is company seeing any business in Bitcoin world after adding Bitcoin to its SNP rewards platform? So, so yeah, so, you know, we don't, look, we like making money. Let me just stop there, right? Mm -hmm. So we do have Bitcoin in our portfolio. We are distributing Bitcoin gift cards across a few of our programs. Is it going to be a driver for a traditional company like a Nestle or a PNG to show up and talk about now? No. Does it sound good to the markets? Awesome, right? Um, like we don't do pumpy kind of stuff, man. You know, unless I have a client who's willing to pay me for something, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. As to like, we have very fundamental rules to stay profitable and to be able to scale without just raising more and more dollars, which is whatever we do, it has to be replicable. Mm -hmm. If it's not replicable, I'm not going to do it. Right. So, so, you know, unless someone's willing to, the only exception to the rule is pay me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Right. If you pay me a lot of money and I think I could make a use case in an industry around it, we will incorporate it. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin gift cards were the start of that. Right. Yeah. We had another client, um, actually, as we expand overseas, you know, that wanted to work with us on NFTs. And we were absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Nobody's pecking it out, you know. Um, has it made me a lot of money right now? No. Can I make a few announcements around it? Yes, but I'd rather make dollar and cent announcements about revenue and EBITDA mm -hmm. than sure. you know, have the stock go crazy and then come right back. Like mm -hmm. we're just building, you know, like again, just remember, guys, when I feel like we have hit, and when my investors, it's not me, you know feel like we have hit and our board a fair valuation we can grow this company hyperbolically from that point in a different format mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but for that i need everybody to believe that this company actually is model works right mm -hmm. and then we'll flip it from a more traditional you know profitable you know slower revenue growth kind of model to okay mm -hmm. let's get market share with revenue growth right yeah. profitability yeah. comes we're not there yeah. yet yeah so, so, so a tool, um, uh, obviously you would benefit the, the, the company greatly by having your share price at a higher price. I mean, are you going to change anything that you're doing IR wise? Are you going to just, you know, sort of continue to do what you're doing right now and wait for the market to, to come or, uh, yeah, or you, or you look at new ideas? Great question. Um, I think you will see us be a little bit more active in the world of investors. Mm -hmm. Start of that was doing what we're doing right now, which is just making sure we get you guys good information. Mm -hmm. which is actually concrete and has substance. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? If you look at our last set of press releases. It's always been about dollars and cents and like renewals or new clients tied to a new industry, new geography, mm -hmm. you know, um, because that will hopefully give people the faith that, you know, this is a real company mm -hmm. that, you know, has, literally a limitless market in front of it, given the different industries we can possibly work in, right? Mm -hmm. you hardcore use cases are in each of them, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not going to be enough, right? So we should, we, you should see us now being more active on the conference front to the extent that, again, it's all about my dollars that I can generate at the bottom line that I can reinvest, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I am starting to take a, smaller portion of our own cash flow and say, okay, let's attend some conferences that, you know, some of these banks are now inviting us. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll make a few announcements about our conference schedule. Um, mm -hmm. It also helps that I don't have to go there physically so I can, you know, focus on sales versus sure. flying around talking to investors, which I don't have a problem doing, but there's only so many days, hours mm -hmm. in a day. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, we will start adding that layer to our communication layer. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and see where that takes us. Right. Um, mm -hmm. we also do have, you know, medium term plans about, you know, looking at our, looking at our share count, looking at, you know, the exchange. Um, but those are just, you know, mm -hmm. things that we are considering. Um, we haven't thought about an IR firm yet, partly because I can never figure out which IR firm I should hire. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, since we run a platform called customer acquisition, retention, and engagements, hopefully we can eat some of our own. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a yeah. Out there. Uh, but we will, we will, you know, again, it, it boils down to cash 
Charity, return. Uh, return. What's the opportunity yeah. cost of spending five thousand yeah. bucks on a conference yeah. in a quarter that I can afford it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and how do I sustain it? I don't want to do a conference yeah. once and be done with it. You could do it, do it yeah. correctly, and do it with you know, yeah. with, with a plan to communicate in that channel. You know, at a cadence that makes sense for the business. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fully understand. Um, we're gonna wrap up real quickly here, so just uh, I want to fire a couple questions for you. But um, you know, wh where where are you in five years? What does this business look like five years from now? Great question. <laughs> I know where I want to be in five years, mm -hmm. but I'm. But a lot of it is a function of what the markets believe about Snip and where it, it starts with. Again, what is a fair valuation for this company today, mm -hmm. which dictates the tactics? You know, mm -hmm. what I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this much, we aren't going anywhere, right? In the sense of, you know, being at risk of, of, of being a company that actually is sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. I know we'll be bigger than we are today and much more successful. The question is, you know, what that structure looks like. Am I a $100 million revenue company? That's, you know, that's now because I've layered in an inorganic strategy along with my organic strategy, right? Mm. Or have I stuck to our guns and, you know, built the company around our core platform, right? By mm. reinvesting dollars that we've generated, right? Mm. And that is the fundamental question, right? Sure. Now, you know, so, but the opportunity is immense. I mean, I would, I would personally want us to, to continue this kind of growth, you know, um, and in five years, you know, we could be in a, in a tremendous place. Right. So it, uh, as investors right now, we're, you know, we, we watch for key metrics or key catalysts. What, what do you think are the one or two key things that we have to keep our eye on to really see that you guys are executing in your business plan? The model we have right now is reinvestment and profitable growth. Like I've said a few times, mm -hmm. we aren't changing that yet. Right. Mm -hmm. so the key catalyst is really going to be share price. Right. If our share price changes, then yes, right? Like if we get to a fair market valuation, mm -hmm. so, so, so short term, profitable growth. Mm -hmm. I've said this, you know, mm -hmm. forever, right? Mm -hmm. Medium term, if that profitable growth translates into fair valuations, right? Can we increase by adding an inorganic layer to our organic model? Mm -hmm. Because all of these, all of these, you know, industries that we are working in because we are a mm -hmm. horizontal solution yeah. you know we can buy clients from you know we can get into those industries very mm -hmm. easily right yeah. that would yeah. be the medium term you know piece of it but it's tied to you know how our stock performs and whether we get to a fair market value because i don't want to give it away you know mm -hmm. what I mean? yeah fully understand um okay this is this is the sort of time we come to where we give you the opportunity to just give a parting message or key takeaway what, what do you want all our listeners to, to walk away with today? Well, I said it last time. I'll say it again. You're going to be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's good. <laughs> I said it last time. And I think you're all very happy. I'm going to say it again. Fantastic. Well, good. Well, that's, uh, I, I love short and sweet and gets right to the point. Um, if somebody wants more information on SNAP, uh, what's the best way to get it? Website, uh, email address? Email our investors, get? email, call me. My cell phone is 415-595-7151. Even if I don't pick it up, leave me a voicemail. I will call you back at some point pretty rapidly. Right? But email us, call me, happier chat. Fantastic. This is great. Um, it's always good to catch up. And, uh, you know, we wish you continued success. Uh, very impressed with what you're seeing so far. Um, we've been speaking to Atul Sabharwal, uh, CEO of Snip Interactive, uh, symbol is SPN on the Venture Exchange. Uh, Atul, thanks for joining us today and, and looking forward to catching up to you uh, in the near future. Yep. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate the time. You bet. Thanks.